It's generally understood that the Yoga Sutras are teaching the Ashtanga Yoga. Um, Ashta, of course, means eight. Ocho, Ashta. And Anga means parts, eight parts. These are the eight stages of yoga, which you probably know, yama, niyama, asana, pranayama, pratyahara, dharana, samadhi, uh, dhyana, and samadhi. So um, we talked about this last time, but of course some of you weren't there, so that won't help you. So I want to talk about samadhi. And then uh, I want to also give a picture of the culture the world, the civilization in which Patanjali was teaching. Patanjali was, you could say, in a sense, teaching for all times. But more specifically, he was teaching within his own time, within a particular world in which certain opportunities were available. And I, I want to talk about that and the difference between our world and his world and to what extent we can apply what he taught and, and, and some things that would be difficult to apply, in fact, might even get you arrested. So, I hope I have your attention. Um, so again, samadhi is a combination of three semantic elements. There's sam, the Sanskrit prefix sam, which means together or complete. And we have that sam from Sanskrit through the Greek, which in Greek they spelled it S-Y-N, and so we have in as sin, as in synthesis or symbiotic. So that S-Y-N, that Greek prefix that we use today is actually the Sanskrit S-A-N, which is the prefix in samadhi. And A has the same meaning in Sanskrit and Greek and English. So A, uh, sometimes you'll see in books uh, it's translated as toward or to. It also is an intensifier. It's a prefix in Sanskrit which intensifies the meaning. So sam a and then dhi, dhi comes from the Sanskrit root dha, which means to place, to put something, to locate something. And so it really means simply to intensely and completely put the mind in something. That's what the word samadhi actually means. And of course, uh, it's the final stage of yoga, the perfection of yoga. Just to just roughly capitulate, no, recapitulate, <laughs> I surrender, capitulate, <laughs> recapitulate uh, the other stages of yoga. Of course, yoga starts out with yama, which means restraint, and they're, they're you could say, practically moral principles or principles to sort of brace yourself morally and, and so on for a very serious yoga practice, which uh, usually went on for many, many, many years. Um, and among these, you'll be delighted to hear, are uh, among these yamas are brahmacharya, celibacy, which is uh, extremely popular in our society <laughs> <laughs> and promoted in many Hollywood films. So, so that's yamas, and there's niyamas, which just means like further rules. And one of these is actually Ishwar Panidana, which means uh, basically devotion to the Lord. So uh, that's another thing so we're talking. It, it, it's, in that sense, it's practically a monastic practice, as it was originally done thousands of years ago, involving celibacy and, and, and devotion to the Lord and so on. And then after you do all that, after you've kind of prepared yourself, you could say mentally, then you have to prepare yourself physically, because if you meditate for many years sitting down, you're going to get amazing cramps. And so therefore, they had asanas. So you can see what the yama niyama is sort of mental preparation. And then there's physical preparation at two stages. Asanas and then pranayama. So you, you can sit for long periods. You can control your breathing, which regulates mental activity. They kind of go in twos, uh, the ashtanga yoga stages, the angas. There's, of course, as I said, the first the two mental preparations, two physical preparations. And then there are two mental, uh, two exercises to prepare the mind for serious meditation. And the first one is pratyahara, which uh, prati means counter in Sanskrit, like to bring a, a counterattack, for example. 
uh, for you there would be a counter attack or uh, another one would be uh, like a countermeasure pratikara and so on. So pratiahara means the mind which tends to stream out into nature, into the world, try to see things and hear things and touch things and smell and taste them. So pratyahara means you reverse that motion of consciousness and you bring it back within yourself. That's pratyahara. And then dharana, holding on. You really have to hang on. That's basically what dharana means. Because one can bring the mind back and then it can just bounce back out. So dharana means you bring it back and you hold it there. You hold the mind within. And so once you've done that, so those, those are the two meditation preps. And then once you've done that, you're ready for meditation. And so the next stage is jhana, meditation. And uh, samadhi means when your meditation becomes very powerful. And uh, because when people start to meditate, generally it's not like in one second you forget everything you ever did in life and all the people you know and so on and so forth. So there's a stage of meditation. And when you really master the meditation, then you go into samadhi at full concentration, and it's in the stage of samadhi that you really start to explore that higher reality. So it's a quite a logical system. Again, it kind of goes in twos. Yama niyama, mental preparation. Uh, asana pranayama, physical preparation. Pratyahara uh, dharana, uh, prepara preparation for meditation by bringing the consciousness within and holding it there then the actual meditation and the advanced meditation, which is samadhi. So there it is. <laughs> so now, having explained that, um, and of course the word sutra, as I explained the other evening, sutra, which is cognate with, that means linguistically related to, the English word suture. Uh, sutra means a thread. It means a thread. and. Uh, in this ancient culture, uh, great value was placed on brevity. Brevity is a soul of wit, and they really uh, got into that idea. In fact, it said, uh, it said about ancient Sanskrit grammarians that uh, an ancient Sanskrit that he, that he would rather eliminate one syllable from the sutra than have a son. It's, that was somewhat tongue in cheek, but. Uh, in fact, ancient Sanskrit grammar was very sophisticated. The, uh, the Western academic discipline of linguistics, sort of the scientific study of linguistics of language, came from the discovery of ancient Sanskrit grammar. So if you look at, uh, if you look at the Sanskrit alphabet, well, imagine my hand is the Sanskrit alphabet. But if you do look at the Sanskrit alphabet, what you find is that it's actually a phonology chart. It's a scientific phonology chart. I mean, consider the R alphabet. A is a technically a diphthong. It's a, it's a, it's a complex vowel, a vowel. Then B is a labial. Anyway, I won't go into the, you didn't come here to hear about phonology. But suffice <laughs> to say, R alphabet is all over the place with vowels and consonants. And, but but Sanskrit, the Sanskrit alphabet chart is actually a it's, it's a phonology chart. And they deeply understood the science of language. The, I mean, it's, it's very sophisticated. So basically, modern linguistics is just kind of a, a modern application of ancient Sanskrit grammar, which was millennia ahead of other parts of the world. So they took language very seriously because they understood that for all the talk of ineffability, that you can't describe the truth in the real world, uh, people do describe, even if you want to say the truth can't be described in words. In fact, uh, one uh, historian of Indian intellectual history said that the people that said that you can't describe the truth with words wrote more books about that than anyone else. I mean, they actually wrote more books than all the people that said you can describe the truth with words. So they understood that language is very important, and therefore you really have to understand language. You, you have to really understand how language is working and, and, and achieve a, a level of precision. And so they valued sutras. They valued sutras, very precise, very pithy, very condensed language where every syllable means a lot. 
And so there's a whole body of sutra literature on many different topics, philosophy, uh, ritual, and, uh, and of course, these are the yoga sutras. So Patanjali, in writing yoga sutras, is placing himself within a genre. And he's not, like, inventing this particular form of literature. Also, as I explained before, there are, in ancient South Asia, ancient India, there were six schools of thought that sort of competed for the minds and hearts of the people. And they also went in twos. And so yoga, Sankhya and Yoga went together. And Sankhya and Yoga meant something like philosophy and practice. And so Patanjali, clearly in the jargon he uses and the language he uses in Sanskrit, is assuming you know Sankhya. He's assuming you know that philosophical background, and he just uses that language. So I'll just very briefly tell you what Sankhya is. Um, the, the philosophy which was common back then and which Patanjali subscribes to and assumes that you know about. Um, the word Purusha literally means person, <laughs> and it specifically refers to the soul within a material body. Patanjali assumes that you know that you are actually a divine being, that you are eternal, and that you're just doing business right now as a material body, you know, a DBA material body. So whether you have a female body, a male body, this ethnicity or that race or this age or that size, whatever kind of body you have right now, that's just your vehicle. Of course, this is taught very elaborately in the Gita and Patanjali assumes that you know that and that's why you want to go within. That's the whole idea. You want to go within to find yourself because you're not going to find yourself just, you know, rubbing your skin or something. You've actually got to go inside to the seat of consciousness. So that's Purusha. There's Prakriti, which is nature, physical nature, and ultimately there's Ishwara, or the Lord. So this is called Tattva Triya, the three fundamental truths which constitute reality, namely souls, ourselves, uh, nature, and the Lord. And actually everything that's in the universe is really just a combination of these three things. Then there are qualities. Maybe that's the last thing I'll mention about the Sankhya, which, and, and that is that, for example, if you go into a bar and it's very dirty and dark and people are screaming and vomiting and everything, that's, you know, it has a certain atmosphere. It's, it has its own ambiance. And if you go into a beautiful meadow with wildflowers and a stream and nice people smiling at each other, that's a different ambience. And if you go downtown and people are running around, you know, trying to make money, that's different. So there are different, there are different qualities in life and different qualities of consciousness. And basically there are three. The lowest one is called tamas, which literally means uh, darkness, sort of ignorance, irrationality, yeah, sort of like madness, either functional or dysfunctional, but it's sort of that dark state of consciousness, the dark side of the force. And then there's passion. There's passion where you follow rules, you have a certain amount of sense control, but kind of everything we do is more or less selfish. There's vanity, there's like, I want that, I want to acquire and achieve, and I want to be better than you, and that, that whole passionate mood, where people are very functional, very organized, uh, but for selfish reasons. And then finally, there's goodness, which means to be serene, peaceful, uh, kind, to do things because they're the right thing to do without selfish motives, to want to help people and all that. So that sort of loving, kind, patient, peaceful consciousness is called goodness. And also, potentially assumes you know that for any kind of spiritual practice, including the one he's going to teach here, you should really be in goodness. You should, you should really be in that state of goodness. I mean, you can't be doing Patanjali's program and, you know, oh, my God, I've got an appointment. I've got a deal to make, and, you know, you're supposed to be. So, so th therefore, I want to talk about, that's a little, just a very simple epitome of, of, of summary of the Sankhya philosophy that Patanjali assumes that you already know, and he's operating within. So I'd like to talk about the world that Patanjali lived in and how it's different from our world, and how it's not, it, not different. It's not different because we're still human beings and, you know, we're, people are people. So in that sense, and, you know, 
nothing's really changed. Uh, but some things have changed. For example, let's just talk about something very spiritual like real estate. <laughs> In the world that Patanjali lived in, uh, there was a huge amount of land, probably most of it that didn't really belong to anybody except God. So if we read, there's another genre of literature called uh, the Puranas, which means the ancient stories. And it's a very prominent genre in the very large books. There's 18 main Puranas, Mahapuranas, and they really are like, like at the heart of the whole culture of ancient India. And also Itihasa, the histories, two great histories, Mahabharata and Ramayana. So in these great literatures, which are very big and have millions of stories, you see unlimited examples of yogis, like real yogis. There's just endless stories about yogis and how they live and what they do. And so I'm going to sort of give you a picture because, again, Patanjali is living in that world. And so when he talks about a yogi uh, or a yoga, that's the world that he's living in, and that's the world he's talking about. So the first thing is that um, yogis, or yoginis, of course, which is just the feminine, pronounced in the West as yogini sometimes, but you know, <laughs> that's okay. I still love it. So yogis and yoginis, they would generally meditate in two places, either up in the mountains, Himalaya. Hima in Sanskrit means cold or snow or ice, and Alaya means place. So the cold place or the freezing place is called Himalaya. And there's a reason why they named it that. So they would go up because it's very cold. So they would go up in the mountains and they would meditate, or they would go into the forest. These, because India had these great forests. In fact, they're often called Mahavana. Maha, from which we get the Latin magna, great. And so the Mahavanas, the great forests, these sort of endless forests. And uh, why did they do that? Why did yogis go to the mountains and the forests? Why? Because they wanted to be alone. <laughs> they wanted to get away from it all for the same reason the Essenes went to the Dead Sea. Because in Israel, there's not a lot of wilderness to choose from. It's sort of a very small place, so the Dead Sea, it's like no one really wanted to go there because it's below sea level and very hot, and so the Essenes went there to get away, to do a, a kind of ancient Jewish yoga ashram. And so, um, so it's very common. If you look, if you, if you ever drive through Italy, which is a very beautiful country, you can actually see these ancient monasteries up on the tops of mountains and the tops of hills. and. And, and so all around the world, ditto, you know, for Buddhist monasteries. So you can see that, I mean, from the beginning of time, people in any tradition that really wanted to get away and meditate and just find God and find the divine truth, however they understood that, uh, they want to get away because when you're in the cities, when you're in town, people are kind of doing anything but that. And uh, they want to get away from liquor shops. There were actually ancient liquor shops. And uh, so they wanted to get away from all this. And um, nowadays, that's a little tough. They have certain advantages. Uh, number one, they lived a very much more natural life. They didn't have cars, computers, cell phones, or indoor plumbing, really. And uh, no electricity. <coughs> and so for them to go out into the forest, the mountains was kind of, you know, they could do that. They could do that, and, um, and the land was free. You could just go into the forest. It's not like, you know, you ran into a sign, no trespassing or government land. And, you know, you, you got to pay something to get in, you know, no overnight camping. <laughs> it wasn't like that. It was really, I mean, even in Europe up till a few hundred years ago, where they actually didn't fence land because it was just, there was, there was like a huge part of England. So it was just common land. And in India, uh, there, yeah, there was no fence. There were no fences. There was no, there was no, the great forest, the mountains. It wasn't private property. It wasn't even government property. It was just God's property. And so you could get away. You could, you could get away. And then once you got away, you weren't just on your own because if you're coming from a city or even coming from a, a village, which most people did. Most people in the ancient world, you know, lived in villages, surrounded by farms. So even if you were coming from a village. 
and you go up into the mountains like, oh my God, you know, what do I eat? And are there any, are any of these leaves poisonous? And, you know, can I get a rash or what do I do? And so, you know, it's romantic. We're going to the mountains. But when you actually get there, it's, oh my God. Or the forest. You know, in India, they had, um, they still do, lions, tigers, leopards, panthers, rhinoceros, and other cute little household pets. So when you went into the great forest, the Mahavana, to be, and again, if you read the ancient literature, this is what Patanjali is talking about. This is the world he's talking about. And in fact, there were um, guides. There were guides. You didn't just go out into the forest to practice yoga or the mountains just out by yourself. There were actually communities. And they would tell you how to do it. Okay, you can eat the leaves of this tree, not that tree. And to keep the tigers away at night, you need to, you know, light this kind of fire or put some kind of oil on yourself. Or so there was a whole program, which also we don't have in the West. And of course, there was celibate. There's no question of you know, you know, going back in your tent with your boyfriend and girlfriend after a hard day's yoga practice and. <laughs> So that's what it was really like. That's what yoga is really like. And now the, the, the best part, you, know, you did it for many, many years. It wasn't just like, hey, let's do a little yoga retreat for a weekend, you know, maybe a three day weekend. It was, you know, we're talking about many, many, many years. You're, you're basically your whole lifetime. It could be many lifetimes. And uh, so to make a long story short, uh, the conditions, the, People in pre-industrial cultures had much greater concentration. I remember a friend of mine, uh, actually Jamal Krishna Goswami, some of you know, he told me that he, when he went to China around 1976, he, he sort of brought bhakti yoga to China at some, at some personal risk because obviously, you know, wisdom was illegal. And so he brought this bhakti yoga to China and he, would, he gave lectures in Chinese universities and, and what really um, what really caught his attention was they had this fantastic attention span. Because back then in China, there was very little, they didn't really have television, hardly, I mean, there was, very, they, they really lived a very simple life, but they had this fantastic attention span. And he said that compared to speaking in a Western university, it, it was completely different. I mean, there it's like, you know, if you can keep their attention for 19 seconds, you're really charismatic. So, so back in the people, I remember there did one study where, you know, Hollywood, I'm from LA. So Hollywood, they, they calculate like the attention span of an average viewer. And it used to be something like 12 seconds, like every 12 seconds, change the camera angle, someone else has to be talking, or you got to go somewhere else in the scene. And then it got down to like 2.5 seconds or three seconds. And so so what I mean to say is that people back in that world had fantastic powers of concentration, which we don't have in the West. And uh, there, were, there was very little distraction. It was a very simple, I mean, it's a profound and beautiful world, but it was very simple. And, and it, everything was very different. So the number of people today that want to go into the wilderness, give up, Electricity, indoor plumbing, internet, computers, everything. Practice celibacy and concentrate for many, 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 many years. And you know, you don't see your family, you don't see your friends. You really go to the world. It's not a huge number, I think. It's not a huge number. So if you want to do that, you're not going to have to wait in line. <laughs> so in a sense. Um, well, I want to bring in now the other most important ancient yoga literature, and perhaps the most important ancient yoga literature of all, which is the Bhagavad Gita. And uh, fortunately, the Bhagavad Gita, which is often described as the single most important literature in India, wisdom literature, it's, everyone kind of agrees on that. Fortunately, it actually shares the same philosophical assumptions as the Yoga Sutras. Because Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita says he's teaching Sankhya Yoga. 
he's teaching philosophy and practice. So there, there's a real harmony between these two literatures. They use a lot of the same terminology, although Christian doesn't go into all the very technical yoga terminology, but basically describes uh, Ashtanga Yoga in the Gita, especially in chapter 6, and he uses the same Sankhya terminology. The Bhagavad Gita, which is generally considered a little bit older than the Yoga Sutras, in a sense is revolutionary because a lot of what Krishna is doing is showing how you take this great yoga tradition, which is very ancient. It's, it's much, much older than Patanjali. Patanjali is talking about something that existed forever when he lived. And Krishna is saying that for, for us, for people of his time even, and today, you can actually practice this yoga in cities, in towns, and with a busy life. And so that's the great breakthrough of Bhagavad Gita. And I mean, if, if one compound word kind of expresses this, this revolution in what's possible in yoga, it's the word karma yoga. Because yoga, of course, we know is a spiritual practice. And karma means action in the world. Actually, the Sanskrit word karma, it also means karma like what's your karma? Or, you know, like you did all these things and you got this karma coming at you. That's sort of a derivative meaning. It is a meaning, but it's a derivative. The, the, the most fundamental meaning of the Sanskrit word karma is just action. And, and therefore, in other words, things you do voluntarily, not things that are done to you, but intentional behavior, action. And uh, it, interestingly, for those of you who are historical linguistic fans, um, it comes from a Sanskrit root kur, or kri, from which we have English words still today, like create, huh? Yes, like create or increase, if you know Spanish, or crecer, create, all that. That's all Sanskrit. It's from the same root as, same Indo-European root as Sanskrit karma. So karma yoga essentially, and of course you can do these yoga practices you're doing here is karma yoga. Karma yoga simply means you do what you do in the world, whatever your career is, whatever your activities are, but you transform it into a spiritual process. And so I thought I would talk about one particular verse in the Gita, which is chapter 4, text 24, and sort of put it in the context of, of the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. And I picked this verse because it, meant, it uses the word samadhi but it uses the word samadhi in a very sort of revolutionary way. And again, uh, Bhagavad Gita came to be the single most important text in the spiritual traditions of India. So uh, whatever Krishna is saying, uh, he persuaded actually more people than anyone else persuaded them. So, so, the, so I'll give you the Sanskrit first, and then if anyone here doesn't know Sanskrit, I'll translate. So, so the verse 424 in Bhagavad Gita is Brahmarpanam Brahmahavir Brahmagnau Brahmanahutam Brahmaivatena Gantabhyam Brahmakarma Samadhi. Now, you may have noticed a lot of Brahmas in there. And so I'll explain what this means. It's very interesting. And oh, by the way, I, uh, uh, warning, you're about to hear an infomercial. Um, <laughs> Last year, I think it was, very short one, I published this Bhagavad Gita, which we, which we call a Comprehensive Guide to Bhagavad Gita, Literal Translation. Um, and I didn't just bring up this verse to, to sell the book, by the way. I swear I did. <laughs> I'm very sincere. It's, um, what I did is, first of all, the translation is extremely literal. And the reason I made it extremely literal is because I personally love the Sanskrit text. I really just fell in love with the Sanskrit text of Bhagavad Gita. And I've been basically reading the Gita in Sanskrit for, oh my God, you know, well over 40 years. And uh, it's so beautifully, it's so elegant. The Sanskrit text is just, it's such an elegant Sanskrit text that uh, it was always my dream to somehow, as far as humanly possible, give those who don't speak Sanskrit fluently that experience. So, you know, as much as humanly possible, you could read the English and know what it feels like to read it in Sanskrit. And so to do that, I even kind of was, I, uh, I tried to keep the number of words in the verse. It generally takes a lot more words to express a Sanskrit 
sentence, but I, I just somehow found ways to keep it, I think, good English, but keep the number of words down. Because even the quantity of words, because when, you, when you're reading, let's say you read at a certain speed, whatever your speed is, it's like if, if let's say, in one minute at your natural reading speed, the more ideas you get in that minute, the more you start to see all the connections and put it all together. And so I found that even the quantity of words affects the rate at which and the, the way in which you assimilate the concepts. And so I really try to do everything humanly possible so that when you read it in English, that's what it feels like to read it in Sanskrit. And then at the beginning of the book, I, um, I took all the main Sanskrit terms in the Gita, like yoga, like jnana, which means knowledge, buddhi, intelligence, uh, yagya, offering, or sacrifice, all the key terms of the Gita, and trace them. So that you take each Sanskrit word and see every time in the book that word occurs and what it means, the different meanings, how Krishna uses the word. It's all categorical. Anyway, that's the book. So in this particular verse, Brahmarpanam Brahmahavir, Brahma is a well-known Sanskrit word, which means the absolute, or spirit, the soul, the absolute truth. In fact, in the Upanishads, which is a uh, an earlier genre of literature, the uh, the word Brahman is like the standard word for meaning the truth, capital T, or the absolute truth, or the eternal spirit. That's a very common word. It comes from the Sanskrit root Bri, which means to be great or to expand. And so in a sense, it means like the greatest or that which is expanded everywhere, Brahman. So um, in the Gita, even though the Gita is technically a different genre of literature, it's not an Upanishad, but it, it's so powerful and it was so influential that it's called the Gita Upanishad. It's kind of, it's it given an honorary membership in that earlier genre of the Upanishads because of its, because it's such a great book. So um, Krishna begins by saying Brahmarpanam. Arpanam means an offering. When you, now this is not charity. In Sanskrit, yajna or arpanam means you offer something to someone greater. Dana, from which we get the English word donation, dana means giving, it's, it's charity. You give to someone less fortunate than yourself. But when you give to someone greater than yourself it, as, as an act of honoring someone or something greater than yourself, that's called yajna or it's called arpanam, an offering. So Krishna says that when you offer something to Brahman, when you offer something to Brahman, to God or to the Absolute, the thing you offer, Brahmarpanam, Brahmahavir, the thing you offer takes on the same same spiritual quality. It becomes transformed. Now, the word that Krishna uses for the thing itself that you offered is Havir, which literally means ghee, like clarified butter. Now, the reason, now Krishna is using the word symbolically, which we know from the context of the Gita, because the classic, the classic paradigmatic offering in this ancient civilization was the fire sacrifice, which you find, by the way, in Greco-Roman culture. You find it all over the world. I mean, all over the world, I mean, thousands of years ago, people understood that fire, Agni in Sanskrit, Agni, from which you get the English word ignite, people understood that Agni or fire could become a representation of absolute, the absolute truth. And so when you offer something into fire, uh, and the fire consumes that offering, of course, the Greeks, if you know the Iliad by Homer, had, or the Odyssey, had non-vegetarian offerings. But in India, they would offer clarified butter or, they, or, or milk and so on. And so in the act of the fire consuming your offering, whatever it is, the idea is that divine power has accepted your offering. And this was understood all over the world, actually. This, this was a universal understanding and practice throughout the world. The Zoroastrians the, uh, were really into fire sacrifice. Everyone was into fire sacrifice. So that was the idea. But Krishna explains in the Bhagavad Gita that the actual physical fire or the physical ghee as in India or whatever you offer and so on, you don't have to actually have a physical fire. This is part of the Bhagavad Gita's revolution. You don't have to perform rituals with fire. For example, your mind can be the fire. And, and now we get into serious yoga practice where Krishna, and, and these are some of the meditations that people actually did. You're, you can sort of envision your mind as the fire 
And then the thoughts that come into your mind are the offering, and, and they're consumed in the sense they're transformed into spiritual thoughts. Or you can offer, Krishna says, you can offer the sense objects, like when visible objects come into your, through your eyes, or sound, or, or taste, and so on. You can offer those into the fire uh, of the senses. So, so your own body becomes uh, a representative or, or, or a manifestation of divine power. Your senses, and, and so your offering, so your senses become symbolically the fire, the divine fire that consumes the offering, the sense objects. So rather, so, say when I see something or hear something or touch something, rather than trying to exploit some sense objects or enjoy it in a selfish way, it actually becomes a sacred offering and I'm offering the sense objects to the divine through the fire of my senses or through the fire of the mind and so on. And Krishna talked about that. Krishna talked about uh, yoga now, the yoga fire. This is actually a term he uses, that, that, that in the spiritual yoga, uh, your yoga practice itself becomes like a fire into which you offer your life, your life energy, your prana, your, your sense experiences, everything. So this this was part of the revolution. In other words, that this powerful process of offering to the absolute, which transforms the offering into that same spiritual nature, it doesn't have to be just a fire and ghee, it can be your own meditation. And, and so therefore Krishna uses the word fire and the word ghee symbolically, as you see in the Gita. So he says, Brahmarpana, when you make an offering, Actually, when George Harrison passed away and they did that concert for George a year later, and uh, Ravi Shankar, the sitarist, uh, wrote some music and he called, it was an offering to George, so he called it Arpanam. You've seen that film. Anyway, so, so Brahm Arpanam, when you offer something to the absolute truth, or the God, or the Lord, or whatever, um, the thing you offer becomes absolute. So if you offer your mind to God, your mind takes on an absolute spiritual nature. In the act of offering, Brahmarpanam, Brahmahavir, Brahmagno, and and the fire that you offered into, whether it's a symbolic fire or a physical fire, takes on the same spiritual nature. And then Brahmanahutam, the person who made the offering, the person who made the offering, takes on the same spiritual nature. So you become transformed into a spiritual entity. So Brahmarpanam, Brahmahavir, Brahmagnau, Ronahutam, and then Brahmaiva Tena Gantavyam, without going into all the grammar here, which I find interesting. But anyway, what it really means is literally that Brahmaiva Tena Gantavyam, that because you made the spiritual offering in various possible ways, uh, your destiny or your destination will be that same absolute realm. That because even on this earth, you transformed yourself into a spiritual being. I mean, we are spiritual beings, but we're kind of uh, a little rusty right now. So through this process of offering, when we again establish ourselves, transform ourselves into pure spiritual being, then Krishna says, you will go certainly, use the word Eva, you will go certainly to that same absolute realm. Brahmai Vatena Gantavyam. And how, and so then Krishna says that this whole process he summarizes as Brahma Karma Samadhi. Or he says, he says, by, it's in the instrumental case, Brahma Karma Samadhi now, by Brahma Karma Samadhi. So that's what I want to talk about. What does this term mean, Brahma Karma Samadhi? And how does it relate to the Patanjali's teaching? because there's no real, there's no contradiction between these two great literatures. Um, Brahma, we know, means the absolute or spiritual. And karma means action here. It's just the simple word action. And so Krishna says there is a samadhi of spiritual action. And, and here's the real, again, the revolution, because you can sit for maybe, you know, 30 or 40 years alone, offline, celibate, no phone calls back home in some frozen place or in some, you know, wilderness 
and meditate. Or, Krishna says, you can simply transform your life itself into yoga. Your whole life can actually become yoga. Because what is our life but a series of actions? You know, the first action may be waking up and getting out of bed. And, you know, and then we just do things all day. And so that's all karma. That's all action. But Krishna says, if you offer those actions, if you offer your life through karma yoga, then Brahma karma, you, act, you enter Brahma karma samadhi. You enter a state of complete trance or absorption through your actions, not by giving up your actions, but by living your life spiritually. And so clearly, that's why the teaching of the Gita opened up this ancient yoga practice basically to everyone. Because it really doesn't matter what you do. I mean, you know, whatever your occupation, vocation, family, whatever, you envision your, your life, your actions as an offering. So whatever you do, if it's walking down the street, if it's teaching, making art, if it's making, you know, if you do business, if you, you know, if you're an athlete, if you're, if you're a musician, it's just like whatever you do, or if you're practicing yoga, if you're actually on a yoga mat and doing that, whatever you do is an offering. And because you're offering that action, you're not doing it selfishly, because that, that's a dead end. That's really a dead end. I mean, we are a very, very tiny part of all of reality, and if we just, we're just self-absorbed, we're missing like almost all of reality. So if we offer our actions, if we offer our actions uh, to the Supreme Ishwara, as Patanjali says, uh, then they all become spiritualized. I mean, your, your family activities, your professional activities, your recreational activities, your yoga practice, everything becomes spiritualized. Everything takes on that same spiritual nature. And therefore, just in the course of living your life, you are in samadhi. And that's essentially what the Gita is teaching. That's really what karma yoga is all about. So I actually have another program tonight because, you know, you don't make a lot of money in this business. So you go, just kidding. So any questions? Any questions on these points? <laughs> Yes. Oh, did we bring these books in? Uh, oh my God, I forgot. Price. Could you go? I actually brought a case of these books. We're asking ten dollars, but if you don't have ten dollars, <laughs> you know, just whatever. I don't need the money. But um, oh, my jacket. There's a car key in that coat, and it's a, it's a, it's an old black fusion, Ford fusion. When you go out the door, it's just down that way, and in the trunk, there's a case of books that someone just sent me from North Carolina supposed to give them out here so if you want a book you can get a book as you can so see I'm a, what's that the book is your translation yes of the Gita yeah the it's this book actually it's a very little translation so whatever I mean translations of the backs so whatever the English says that's really what's in the Sanskrit even in cases where the Sanskrit sort of esoteric or, or a little hard to understand I just left it like that because when you read it in Sanskrit some things are just not clear on the surface, and I thought, well, that's how it sounds in Sanskrit, so that's how it should sound in English. So I didn't try to make the esoteric exoteric. Do you I, have an example? What? You, can we leave an example? Oh! You, we never got through the one that you wrote, we just got the Sanskrit, but not the English, I don't think. Oh, okay. Let's see. Um, Yeah. Well, here's one verse. This is just uh, chapter 13, text 14. And it's, uh, it says, I shall declare to you the knowable, knowing which one enjoys the immortal, beginningless Brahman, subordinate to me, and said to be neither being nor non-being. Everywhere are its hands and feet, everywhere its eyes, head and mouth. It hears everywhere in the world, encompassing all, it stands. So, you know, you kind of have to think a little bit about that. <laughs> yeah. Or resembling all sense modes, it is devoid of all senses, unattached, it alone sustains all, modeless and mode ruler. Of course, I explained some of these key terms earlier in the introduction, but um, 
in most of the books, actually, the, the systematic philosophical explanation take all the important concepts of the Gita, and they're just given <coughs> categorically one after the other. And it assumes that you don't know anything about it. I mean, I mean, I wrote from the perspective for, for a reader who's never even heard of the word Krishna before. So that's what it is. Anyway, any questions? Yes, please. Just as an aside, <clears throat> Oh, very much. Uh, ancient Persian, the ancient Persian language is a dialect of ancient Sanskrit, <coughs> which is well known among linguistic historians. So they, uh, in fact, the first great Persian emperor, Cyrus, who abolished slavery and declared universal religious freedom in his empire. So I mean, he was such a good guy, he's called a messiah in the Old Testament because he freed the Jews from Babylonia and sent them back to Israel and gave them a little money to help build, rebuild their temple. Uh, his actual name in his own ancient Persian language was Kurus, which is one of the most famous names for kings in the Vedic Sanskrit civilization. So, what's that? Kauravas. Yeah, Kauravas, from the word Kuru, one who descends from Kuru is called a Kaurava. Yes. In more recent times, with this whole partner thing, and what you do going on Sunday. Well, Agni, Agni is a big deal in this in this ancient civilization, and because fire was, um, you know, all the either physical fire or um, symbolic fire was used in all these sacred practices. In fact. The god Agni was conceived of a type of messenger, kind of almost like a Hermes, in the sense that um, when you make your offering, it's Agni, which is conveying your offering to the Supreme. And so, yes, yeah, so, so Agni is very prominent. I mean, there's no question that the ancient Persian civilizations, Zoroastrians, they were, you know, very, they had a lot to do with the ancient Vedic civilization. They were neighbors. Yes. Oh, <laughs> we have a ceremony one week before the spring. We set fire and we jump to the fire and we say the word. We give all the negativity, all the kind of sickness, illness. We jump to the fire. We say the fire gave me the beauty, give me the peace, give me the health. And that night. Uh, whole nation celebrate, uh, do pastry, cookie, and everything, everybody comes out of food to celebrate the birthday of the same time. It's interesting, after all these years, there's, there's still remnants of their ancient civilization. Do you not think that's also why they burn the bodies on the Ganges and then they're giving the body back to the fire? Do you think that could be part of it? Yeah, that's a very good point. It's a very good point. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Yes. Yeah, the Bhagavad Gita, in a sense, is unique. Um, It's certainly not a sectarian book. I mean, it's not at all a sectarian book. In Bhagavad Gita, what you know, what you get in terms of karma or divine reward, it just depends on the quality of what you do. There, there are no doctrinal requirements in the Bhagavad Gita. You don't have to believe a particular doctrine. It depends on whether you're a good person or not. And um, the Gita is unique in the sense that if we look at the the, the holy books of you know great world religions. It's actually the only, it's, it's the only tradition which claims that God personally came to the world and actually lived a life, actually lived a full life on the earth. And according to tradition, that's about 5,000 years ago. And there's talk of the Son of God or the Prophet or different manifestations of God, certainly communicating to people like in the early parts of the Old Testament. But the idea of God personally coming and living a speaking philosophy is is a somewhat unique claim 
and uh, in India, what's interesting about India is there it was a um, there was freedom of religion, also in Greco-Roman civilization until until Constantine, but. The, the ancient pagan civilization had freedom of religion. They were really into religious syncretism, the idea that there's only one truth that's called by different names, by different people. This goes back to the earliest ancient literature, this, this broad-minded view. And Krishna certainly teaches the same thing. So, um, so, so it's a very tolerant tradition. At the same time, it, it makes certain specific claims, but they're not exclusive claims. It, it's not meant to refute other claims, but there's also the idea that, I mean, the word Krishna, Krish comes from the Sanskrit root, Krishna, I mean, comes from Sanskrit. Krish means to attract. Krish means to attract. So if you think of the relation in English between the word traction, like attractor, and attraction. And so attraction is something like mental traction something that pulls your mind to it, you're attracted. And so that's the root of the word. So Krishna, na, is taken as an abbreviation of the Sanskrit root, nand, which means, you know, pleasure, give pleasure. And so it, it's, it's from that root, you get words like ananda, ananda, which means bliss. And so, so from ancient times, Krishna's, they've taken Krishna to mean the one who's infinitely beautiful and the source of all pleasure. Also Rama, Rama, the word Rama, comes from the Sanskrit root, which means to enjoy, or to give pleasure, and so, in fact, there's an ancient verse that, um, Ramante yogi no anante, the yogis, which here means the spiritual practitioners, the yogis enjoy in the infinite. In other words, a true yogi doesn't seek pleasure in finite things, but in infinite things. So, Ramante yogi no anante, satyanande, in the bliss of truth. For example, let's say, I'm having a good time at a party because I think I'm the center of attention. Well, that's not really the truth because I'm not actually the center of reality. I'm just one tiny soul. And so and the nature of vanity is that I'm enjoying something which is ultimately not real. Or, for example, if I, if I take my body to be myself, but ultimately I'm not the body, and so I'm enjoying in a false identity. So it's that the yogis, they enjoy in the infinite and specifically the bliss of truth, satyananda. And that bliss of truth is chidatmani, the, the pure consciousness of the self, the pure consciousness of the self. And therefore, and of course, self here can be capital S and refer to the Supreme, to the Lord. And so, iti, thus, therefore, for these reasons, rama padena sao parang brahma vidyate, the Supreme Brahman, the Absolute Truth, is designated by the name Rama, by the word Rama. Because in Sanskrit, Rama, without going into all the grammar, but the word Rama means a source of pleasure. Rama means a source of pleasure. And so, in, uh, and because the, the true yogis, the true spiritual practitioners, find pleasure in this infinite spiritual being, existence, and therefore, that being is called Rama, the source of pleasure for the yogi. So it, it's a very interesting tradition. It's also, I mean, just in India, I mean, just I don't want to sound like a crass carnival salesperson, but uh, in, in this open marketplace, in this in this open culture where everyone was free to preach whatever they wanted, Buddhism, for example, arose around 2,500 years ago and directly claimed that the Vedas, you know, don't trust what you read in the Vedas. That's all false. And imagine in medieval Europe or even later Europe, if someone went around saying the Bible's all false, it's all nonsense. I mean, would you survive like five minutes or two minutes or maybe 45 seconds? So, but they could do that. I and mean, Buddhism became a very important religion in India before, for various reasons, it declined and then moved to the East. But, and Jainism, which was, all, was, was actually atheistic, they believed in eternal soul and karma, but no God. And Jainism became prominent way back when. And they did that by directly, argue, you know, rejecting what was essentially the religion of the land. And yet, no one fought over it. No one thought, like, take that back or I'll 
you know, shoot an arrow at you. It was just because they understood that people had the freedom. You know, people, there's freedom of conscience, and if you think that's the truth, you can preach it, and you know, we'll try to give arguments on the other side, and just people are free to choose what they want. So I'm saying in that atmosphere for thousands of years, we had every imaginable type of religiosity and spirituality for the simple reason that India, geographically, very fertile land, has the best natural irrigation system on earth. Just Google river map of India, and you'll see that there are powerful rivers everywhere in India. And so mild climate, conclusion, it always had a big population in comparison to the rest of the world. Not like nowadays, nothing like nowadays, but... India always sustained a large population. People always had a natural inclination for spirituality. There was complete freedom. You put all those things together and you get every conceivable variety of human religiosity and spirituality. And in that free society, which was intellectually very sophisticated, there were a lot of debates going on. And I mean, it was a very interesting society. The big winner, after a thousand of years, the big winner that kind of swept over India and became the most popular thing was Krishna and Bhagavad Gita. And this was in a highly literate, highly educated, spiritually inclined society with complete freedom, no government pressure, like you got to do this or else. And, and so this whole tradition of Bhagavad Gita and the larger work of the peers in Mahabharata and, and of course other literatures you may not know like Bhagavad Purana, um, it's interesting because over thousands of years it emerged as the most powerful tradition in India, so much so that Western scholars say that today in what they call Hinduism, that's another topic, what they call Hinduism, uh, two-thirds to th two of three-fourths of all Hindus are actually Vaishnavas. They worship Krishna in some form or another, some avatar or another. So it had tremendous historical power, this tradition, and... Um, and so just present it here for you and you can just, you know, consider it. See what you think. So thank you very much. Um, thank you. So I would yeah. love to stay with you and uh, all that, but I actually, you know, so. Do you accept checks for your book? Yeah, yeah, whatever. Okay. I'm, uh, yeah, if you'd like a book, uh, I, you know, it's $10. It's just because I thought I don't want to charge a lot of money for things. So thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh, Dave. I'm uh I'm, I'm fine. Oh, I forgot. We uh Oh, thank you all for listening out there. <laughs>